Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a prime week. You know what, Chooms? For decades now, we've had two very effective 5 air blockers available to us to fight the Slaphead Curse. I'm, of course, talking about Finasteride and Dutasteride. Finasteride was the first FDA-approved 5 air blocker. It was approved for treating an enlarged prostate way back in the year 1992, and it was approved for treating hair loss in 1997. Dutasteride came a bit later. It was approved by the FDA in 2001, and it was only officially approved approved to treat prostate enlargement, but it is still commonly prescribed off-label as the most effective hair loss treatment ever invented. That's why the illustrious users of Dutasteride are known in the hair loss community as the Dutasteride Master Race. Never before has there been a drug better suited to defeat the slaphead curse. It is the most powerful hair loss drug ever invented. Or is it? Well, since most people don't remember an era before social media, not many people know this. But back in the 1990s when Finasteroid was FDA approved, there were a whole lot of other 5 air blockers in the pipeline. Some of these other 5 air blockers even had distinct advantages over the two drugs available today, Finasteride and Dutasteride. Yet, despite this fact, Finasteride and Dutasteride are pretty much the only 5 air blockers people know about. These other 5 air blockers are largely forgotten about these days because one by one they were abandoned by the drug companies, and most people have never even heard of them. But keep in mind here, Chums, the 1990s was a primordial era in hair loss prevention, and so back then, there were many drugs trying to compete with each other to become the winner in the hair loss drug competition. It's kind of similar to when VHS had to compete with Betamax, or Blu-ray had to compete with HD DVD. Does anyone remember those formats? In the end, though, there can be only one, or in the case of hair loss treatments, two, even though finasteride is the only one that has ever been FDA approved for treating hair loss. It is a bit of a quirk of history that we ended up with just two FDA-approved 5 air blocking drugs, and that those two drugs turned out to be finasteride and dutasteride. Maybe in an alternative timeline, we'd be talking about terosteride or epristeride, and we'd have people talking about how they have post-epristeride syndrome, or how terosteride gave them a numb anus. But in this timeline, it is finasteride and dutasteride that get all the attention. But is it possible that maybe, just maybe, we've been taking the wrong 5 air inhibiting drugs all along? Is the dutasteride master race at risk of being deposed by an even more powerful hair loss drug? But regardless of whether you are a finasteride peasant or a member of the dutasteride master race, I think we all could probably agree here that it would definitely be nice to have other 5 air blockers available to us. After all, there are people who respond better to dutasteride than finasteride, and vice versa, so it would be nice to be able to try out these different drugs if for some reason you don't find yourself fit again with the finasteride peasantry or the dutasteride master race. Now, I'm sure someone is writing in the comment section right now, but given we already know that if you take dutasteride at 0.5 milligrams per day, you become a member of the dutasteride master race, and there's even a dutasteride exalted race that takes dutasteride at 2.5 milligrams per day. You always say that you could suppress your serum DHT by 96% and your scalp DHT by 7 79% with 2.5 milligrams of dutasteride per day. There's no way it can get better than that, can it, bro? Well, the master race is sort of correct here. It can't get better than that, but that's only if you limit yourself to the binary choice of either finasteride or dutasteride. But what about those other 5 air inhibiting drugs that never got approved? Well, being that these drugs are definitely obscure, they're not as easy to acquire. But if you go to a chemical research supply website and look up a list of 5 air blocking drugs, you see not just finasteride and dutasteride for sale, but also drugs like epristeride and MK386, as well as CGP53 and many others as well. Wikipedia has an even longer list of non-FDA-approved 5 air blocking drugs. There are 29 drugs on the list. There's an even longer list of plants and fungi that all have 5 air blocking activities. Although, if you guys remember my video on reishi mushrooms, I explained how none of these natural 5 air blockers are effective enough at blocking the 5 air enzyme to actually stop hair loss. But I still wanted to bring this up, because it's especially interesting that people who claim to have post-finasteride syndrome after exposure to finasteride don't seem to realize that they are exposed to 5 air blocking agents literally every single day, all the goddamn time. Black pepper, black tea, green tea, even zinc is a 5 air enzyme blocker, and zinc is an essential mineral for human health, so people will use it every day. They need to in order for survival. 5 air blockers are as ubiquitous in nature as air and water. They are literally found everywhere 
everywhere in nature. So when you take finasteride, it's definitely not going to be your first exposure your body has had to a 5-air blocker. That's not possible. So people who claim that a brief exposure to finasteride causes permanent side effects in the form of post-finasteride syndrome, they really can't account for why everyone in the world doesn't have the same syndrome because everyone has had some exposure to naturally occurring 5-air blockers throughout their lives. Literally every single person on planet Earth. So if people who think they got post-finasteride syndrome from taking one finasteride tablet two years ago, how do they know it wasn't from a cup of tea that they had for breakfast a few weeks ago? How come we don't hear about post-black pepper syndrome or post-zinc syndrome? Hell, even salmon has a naturally occurring 5-air inhibitor in the form of astaxanthin. So how come we don't hear about post-salmon syndrome? But now that I've made this video, I'm sure we'll soon see a video from Moral Medicine where a guy claimed to get post-salmon syndrome by driving past a red lobster. Anyways. I don't want to get off the subject here, but I think you guys can see just how ridiculous the whole concept of post-finasteride syndrome really is. These guys are absolutely crazy. But the point is, is that there is a whole list of 5 air blocking drugs that were researched in the 1990s, but which never obtained FDA approval. Now, for some of these drugs, there is very little published research available, but a few of them can be pretty close to being marketed, and some of those drugs have some unique properties that are different than the properties of finasteride and dutasteride. For example, epristeride is a 5 air blocker that is actually sold in China, and I already made a video on it that I'll link below, so if you have access to a Chinese pharmacy online, you can actually buy a Pristeride today. But just to sum up what I went over in that video on a Pristeride, a Pristeride is similar to finasteride, however it is a slightly more powerful blocker of the type 2 5-air isoenzyme than finasteride is, though it's not as powerful of a type 2 blocker as dutasteride. It is an even weaker blocker of the type 1 5-air isoenzyme than finasteride, which already has a very negligible blocking effect on the type 1 5-air isoenzyme. So, any effect a pristeride has on the type 1 5-air isoenzyme is borderline homeopathic because finasteride is already 100 times weaker at blocking the type 1 5-air isoenzyme than dutasteride. Also, because of the way a pristeride binds to the 5-air enzyme, it doesn't increase testosterone levels. Finasteride, on the other hand, can increase testosterone levels by 10% and dutasteride by even more, by 25%. Now, you may be thinking, wow, an increase in testosterone, that sounds great. And indeed, sometimes that is great, which is why why some people get improved libido on finasteride or dutasteride. But this increase in testosterone can sometimes get metabolized by the aromatase enzyme into estrogen, and that can cause a decreased ratio of testosterone to estrogen, which can rarely give people side effects. This imbalance between testosterone and estrogen levels is what actually causes side effects from finasteride and dutasteride. The side effects aren't due to the lowering of DHT levels. If that were true, then everybody would get side effects from these drugs because they lower serum DHT levels by at least 70%. If anyone were to lower their testosterone levels by 70%, then they would all feel strong side effects and they would feel them immediately. But that doesn't happen when you suppress DHT because DHT is a trash hormone and testosterone isn't. That's why the incidence of side effects from finasteride and dutasteride is very low. The absolute risk of side effects from finasteride is only about 2% and dutasteride may even have a lower risk of side effects despite being a more potent drug. So one of the benefits of a pristeride is that it might have an even lower risk of side effects than finasteride or dutasteride since it doesn't raise testosterone levels. But there isn't enough human research on the drug to confirm that for sure, which is one of the reasons why it's sold in China, but not in Europe or the United States. But that's just one pretty obscure 5 air blocking drug that we're talking about that might have some benefits over finasteride. So what about the other drugs on the list? Well, we're not going to go over every one of those drugs because with many of them, there isn't enough research data to make any strong claims about their safety or efficacy, but there is one exception. I'm talking about terosteride. Terosteride, it kind of reminds me of topical cyclosporine in the sense that it was an extremely promising hair loss treatment that never got the follow-up research it deserved and it ended up being abandoned completely. I'll go ahead and link my topical cyclosporine video below if you want to know more about that. But for a while, it really looked like terosteride was on course to become the main competition for finasteride. It was to be to finasteride what the Camaro is to the Mustang, or Ronnie Coleman was to Jay Cutler, or Goku to Vegeta. We were on the verge of having a real rivalry here, but then fate intervened. So, here's the chemical formula of terosteride. As you can see, it is similar in structure to finasteride. In fact, almost all 5 air blockers have similar chemical appearances, and that's because they are all derivatives of testosterone. Here you can see just how similar finasteride is to testosterone. The reason for these similarities 
is that these drugs were designed on purpose to bind with a 5-AR enzyme and thus prevent testosterone from binding with the 5-AR enzyme. That is called competitive binding. Epristeride is an exception though because it inactivates the 5-AR enzyme without competing with testosterone and that's the reason why epristeride doesn't raise serum testosterone levels. Anyways, getting back to terosteride, it was developed by an Italian drug company called Pharmitalia Carlo Erba. The first study on the drug was published in 1993, a year after finasteride was FDA approved, so you can tell this Italian drug company and other companies were very eager to cash in on Merck's success with finasteride. According to the article, terosteride was already undergoing phase 1 studies back in 1993 for treating an enlarged prostate. The study compared terosteride to finasteride and found that the two drugs were very similar. However, finasteride was just a little better than terosteride at suppressing 5-AR activity in the prostate gland. Depending on the dose, terosteride decreased the DHT in the prostate by 61 to 79 percent, while finasteride decreased it by 75 to 83 percent. However, serum DHT actually decreased more with terosteride than finasteride, though for some reason, in the study, the decrease in serum DHT was only about 40%, which is less than other similar studies where finasteride decreased serum DHT by about 70%. Nevertheless, there is one big difference between terosteride and finasteride, and that is its effects on serum testosterone levels. Terosteride had no effect on serum testosterone or prostate testosterone levels, while finasteride at its highest dose increased serum testosterone and prostate testosterone markedly. So this is a very similar situation to what was seen with the pristeride. Terosteride, like a pristeride, does not raise testosterone levels, which would indicate that it could potentially have a better side effect profile than finasteride or dutasteride. The authors concluded that, quote, the absence of this secondary increase in testosterone with terosteride may represent an advantage over other inhibitors. In this respect, terosteride appears to be a promising candidate for the treatment of androgen-dependent diseases, unquote. So notice how he said diseases plural. So that means the authors are also talking about androgenic alopecia. So, a year later, the same authors published another study on terosteride that provided a few more details. The article compared terosteride again to finasteride, but it also compared it to another 5-AR inhibiting drug that was being investigated at the time called 4-MA. 4-MA is interesting because it is a drug that blocks both the type 1 and the type 2 5-AR isoenzymes, kind of like dutasteride. The study found that both finasteride and terosteride did not affect testosterone synthesis or the aromatase enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. However, the study did find that 4-MA blocked an enzyme called 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, also known as 3-beta-HSD. Unfortunately, 3-beta-HSD is a critical enzyme in the synthesis of both progesterone and testosterone. So even though 4-MA has some attractive features with properties similar to dutasteride, unlike dutasteride, it could also lower testosterone levels and not just DHT. So that's probably why it was never considered seriously as a 5-year blocker for human use. Anyways, the study found that at low doses, finasteride was more effective than terosteride, but at higher doses, the two compounds were similarly effective. Now, these were animal studies we're talking about, so we can't extrapolate the dose for humans from these animal doses, but nevertheless, overall, the biochemical profiles were very similar. However, these were very early studies, and they didn't look at the specific effects of terosteride on the type 1 and type 2 5-AR isoenzymes because they weren't very well understood at the time. This is very important because the type 1 5-AR isoenzymes are present mostly in the sebaceous gland of the skin, while the type 2 5-AR isoenzymes are much more important because they're located in the hair follicles and the prostate gland. So simply put, it is the type 2 5-AR isoenzyme that causes hair loss, not the type 1. Looking at research that came out a bit later, we have this study from 1995 that did look at the effects of terosteride, finasteride, and 4-MA on the different 5-AR isoenzymes. The study found that terosteride was a weak type 1 5-AR isoenzyme blocker. It was a slightly stronger type 1 blocker than finasteride, which itself is a very weak type 1 blocker. 4-MA was a stronger type 1 5-AR blocker than either finasteride or terosteride, though. But the point is, neither finasteride nor terosteride suppress enough of the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme to cause any problems with my neurosteroids! Because even dutasteride, which is 100 times stronger than finasteride at suppressing the type 1 5-AR isoenzyme, still doesn't cause any neurological side effects. So, 
We've talked a lot about the type 1, but what about the isoenzyme that actually causes hair loss, the type 2 5-air isoenzyme? With the type 2 isoenzyme, the three drugs were more similar in their effects. The strongest of them was 4-MA. Finasteride gets second place, and finally, we have terosteride at third place, but it's only barely weaker than finasteride. So, it looks like terosteride is very similar to finasteride in terms of its chemistry, and probably would have very similar efficacy to finasteride in treating hair loss. However, terosteride might actually have some other distinct advantages over finasteride, and I'm not just talking about in terms of side effects. This study here looked at the effects of terosteride on the growth of prostate tumors, which are very sensitive to androgen levels. Finasteride does not shrink prostate tumors, and it is thought that might be because even though finasteride decreases prostate DHT, it also increases prostate testosterone. However, terosteride was found to shrink prostate tumors almost as much as castration. The authors of the study felt that this benefit of terosteride was due to the fact that terosteride does not increase testosterone in the prostate. So, it seems that terosteride is very similar to apristeride, except apristeride is actually a slightly stronger blocker of the type 2 5 air enzyme than finasteride, while terosteride is just a slightly weaker one. Also, terosteride is a slightly stronger type 1 5 air isoenzyme blocker than finasteride, while apristeride is an even weaker type 1 5 air isoenzyme blocker than finasteride, which is already an extremely, extremely weak type 1 blocker. Like apristeride, terosteride doesn't increase testosterone levels, contrary to what happens with finasteride and dutasteride that both raise testosterone levels. Like I explained earlier, this could be an advantage for many people though, since the increase in testosterone can increase estrogen levels and therefore cause side effects. Unlike apristeride, where the mechanism is well understood, we still don't know the exact reason why terosteride doesn't increase testosterone levels. It could be similar to the way apristeride works, but it was never investigated as far as I can tell. Unfortunately, terosteride was abandoned, just like apristeride and so many other 5 air blockers. They could still be bought online from gray market pharmacies and chemical research websites, but keep in mind, Chums, that we don't have any high quality human data of these drugs. It's clear that terosteride underwent phase 1 trials, but they were never completed, or at least never published, so there's no human clinical trial data on terosteride. As far as apristeride goes, there's only one study published in abstract form that included 91 men that just confirmed that it lowered serum DHT levels without raising serum testosterone levels. So, I don't know why these promising drugs were abandoned, but my suspicion is that the reasons were economic in nature and not due to any inherent flaw with the drugs themselves. The FDA drug approval process is very expensive, so maybe the drug companies felt that terosteride and apristeride were not that distinctively different from finasteride to warrant the expense. I think the drug manufacturers thought that finasteride would give them too much competition to make the drugs commercially successful. In the end though, I think the 5 air blockers that were approved by the FDA, specifically finasteride and dutasteride, were the right ones. Having said that though, I think we definitely do need more 5 air inhibitors on the market, and not just for hair loss. 5 air inhibitors are being researched to this very day for their numerous health and longevity benefits, and more and more data is confirming that the use of 5 air inhibiting drugs can help prolong life. And even if these specific 5 air inhibitors aren't as good at stopping hair loss as finasteride or dutasteride, they could still potentially have other benefits, and I think that needs to be researched. What I think we really need here is a worldwide 5 air inhibitor revolution. The benefits of 5 air inhibitors are far too great to be ignored, and it's a shame that promising drugs like terosteride and apristeride were essentially just abandoned completely without being fully evaluated. I wonder if these drugs would be good alternatives for men who get side effects from the FDA approved 5 air blockers, or perhaps whether it would be a good intermediate drug between finasteride and dutasteride. But who knows, maybe these drugs will come back into vogue one day. After all, oral minoxidil exploded in popularity a couple years ago, even though the clinical trials that existed on oral minoxidil at the time showed it to be a very dangerous drug. So maybe Dr. Rodney Sinclair or someone else can look into this. If oral minoxidil can make a comeback, then so can these other hair loss drugs, I think. So the question remains, is there any 5 air inhibitor that is more potent than dutasteride? Unfortunately, the answer seems to be no. The dutasteride master race still remains the pinnacle of a elite hair loss nobility, but just because dutasteride is the most potent choice doesn't always mean that it is the best choice, and I still think there's a lot of potential in these other 5 air inhibitors that is worth exploring. Anyways, I hope you all found this exploration of alternative 5 air blocker realities interesting, and I'll be back with some more premium content in the very near future. Thank you all so much for watching Hair Loss Witchers, I'll see you all next time. God bless.